Hello everyone and welcome to another SEDS online webinar. We're really pleased to be able to offer these events for free and um, thanks to generous funding from the International Association of Sedimentologists, the IAS. We now have nearly 600 members on the SEDS online community which is amazing really considering that we only launched the new website just over two weeks ago um, and we've been running for a month, I think it's our one month birthday tomorrow. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, John is kindly offering to, has kindly offered to deliver this webinar on his birthday and on Earth Day. So happy birthday and happy Earth Day um, to everyone. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Dr. John Nove. So John completed his undergraduate degree at Imperial College London and went on to the University of London to do his master's and PhD in sedimentary geology. He began his professional career in mining, where he worked for GenCorp and ran mines for four years, and then he moved to British Telecom to work as a marine geologist for a further four years. In 1998, John moved to Shell and has now been in the oil and gas industry for over 20 years. John is presently adjunct professor at University of Alberta and president of his own geological consultancy and training company at Sedimentary Services in Calgary. John has a unique appreciation of sedimentology, and for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we could think of no better speaker to represent the wonder and weirdness of our sedimentary landscapes. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, John. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Happy Earth Day. Uh, today, I'm going to be sharing some details of the weird and wonderful world of sedimentology. It's going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour, and the idea is to try and get you guys thinking a little bit outside the box about sedimentology. The presentation features material from a variety of just variety of material from some of the BSRG talks that I've given in the past, as well as some new material as well. So we'll be talking about the sedimentology of ice and snow, the sedimentology of clouds, some useful concepts from industry, from recent work in industry, uh, just some very weird sedimentology, some crazy ichnology, something about the giants of sedimentology, the biggest sedimentology on the planet, and then we're going to finish off by celebrating Earth Day by going off world and talking a little bit about exoplanets and what we might expect to see in sedimentology from them as well. So let's start off with ice and snow. Uh, there's a variety of features that you see in ice and snowy areas and having moved to Calgary I've had lots and lots of experience of these. So I'm just going to go through some of the sedimentary structures that you might expect to see and hopefully you can see ways to apply some of these concepts from the modern world to the ancient and the sedimentology that you guys are looking at out there. So let's start off with dunes. And there's lots and lots of types of dunes that are formed from transported snow. So if you go to particularly lake surfaces, which are nice and flat, then you get these dunes building up on the lakes. And you can see Barken dunes, planar crested dunes, and also ripples that form on these surfaces. And then you also get surfaces that are formed that are carved from the snow. So these are where you've already had your snowpack laid down and then they've been carved into shape. And of these, the most dramatic are probably what are called penitente, which you do see here, but rarely in, in Canada, but certainly you see in South America, where severe wind erosion leads to these structures that may be as much as six feet tall. These are beautiful structures. These ice balls uh, formed very rarely, but uh, when they are, they're just the most dramatic sight that you're ever gonna see. And what happens is that when you have ice sheets, if the weather is fairly extreme and it breaks up the ice sheets, then you end up with lumps of ice that are floating around in a shallow marine setting. And these get weathered and they, they break off the chunks off each other. And you end up with sometimes an incredibly well sorted supply of these ice balls. And I, I do see this as a very interesting area for studying things like sorting and zonation within these features. Another feature that we come across sadly all too often in Calgary are hailstones. And uh, it's really very, very little work done on them and absolutely none from a sedimentological point of view. I had my first big encounter with them in Calgary in, in 2010. And the picture on the bottom right there is of my car. And you can see that my car has had an all too close encounter with hailstones. And it was estimated that this particular hailstorm that came through Calgary did around $550 million worth of damage. When you look at the hailstones themselves, and that picture up there is taken with my trusty penknife, so that's in my garden, our hailstones that day got up to around golf ball size. And that 
the hailstones themselves form as accretionary structures around dust grains. So they're basically an accretionary structure similar to armored mud balls and things like that. And they may be fractured as well. And they can get moved along by the currents and they can actually form dunes. And the, the picture on the bottom left there is some incredible dunes that were formed in New Mexico as a result of a giant hailstorm that happened there. The, the biggest hailstone ever is around 10 inches in diameter. And that particular storm in 1986 killed 92 people. So they are very dangerous as well. But certainly from a depositional point of view, they're pretty interesting in terms of being a kind of coarse conglomerate with a very limited lifespan. Avalanches, uh, there's quite a lot of work done on avalanches, obviously, because they are a, a, a real danger. And uh, we certainly, you have to be extremely careful in uh, places like Calgary, where we're living, when you get out into the mountains, they, they assess the avalanche risk every day. And there are two main types of avalanche, and these are loose snow and slab avalanches. And they're facilitated by convex slopes, if you have surface crusts, and if you have layers of large angular snow crystals. So that those will form a, a zones of weakness within the, the snowpack, which can then lead, trigger collapse. And persistent cold temperatures really uh, avoids the snow stabilizing and stops any melting that might weld the sediment together. And the slab avalanches, which are the most dangerous, they form when the stresses lead to structural failure within a weak layer and you get delamination. So you'll get a big lump of snow that will work its way down the hill. And that, that picture on the bottom left there is showing a, a typical avalanche. One of, one of the interesting features that I haven't put on the slide here is that when you get an avalanche, the snow absolutely locks itself together. So it, it will slide down and you can move the snow around, but within a few seconds, it locks into concrete. And that's why avalanches are so dangerous. You, you might think to yourself, well, I can climb my way out of this snow, but the snow locks into place and uh, it's, it's impossible for you to even push through it with a hand. Anyway, the interesting thing about these avalanches is that there's lots of us that are studying slope failures, MWDs and, and mass movement in, the, in the, the submarine settings. And you, I think there's a lot to be learned from avalanches and how avalanches behave that we can apply. And finally, I can't uh, move on without mentioning the famous DLTs, duck landing traces. And I've moved on now to GLTs, which are goose landing traces. And if you look at the bottom left there, you can see that what the, the typical structure that you see when these, these birds land is a bit of wingage here. So the wings and tails are just touching down on the sediment and they skid along the ground and then they come to a rest just beyond their landing trace. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to recognize these in the fossil record, obviously more likely in mudstones than, than in snow. It ha has to be said that snow provides a great setting to practice your ecnology because you can look at the behavior, like this little random warp pattern here from a duck and, and magpies. You can look at underprints and how they form and, and the impact of those, which is something that you see in mudstone settings as well. And you can just see a lot of, of, of aspects of animal behavior that, that while transient and very temporary in snow, they certainly allow you to explore the, the interpretation of these traces. Okay, let's move on to the sedimentology of clouds. And when you mention this to people, they usually give you a kind of smirk, like you're kidding me, right? But when you think about what clouds are, they're structures made up of particles which are transported by flowing currents. And that's pretty much a perfect analogy to plastics. So the atmosphere provides us with a sedimentological laboratory, sort of like a mega flume tank. And in that flume tank, we can examine flow, turbulence. We can look at the flow from underneath, which is something that's pretty difficult to do when you have a flume tank. And we can look at the impact of a reduced gravitational effect because these obviously these particles are very, very light. And it's on a scale that's much larger than anything that we see on the Earth's surface. So when you look at clouds, you generally split them into three zones. So you have your very high clouds, which are usually made up of tiny ice crystals, and they look pretty wispy, these clouds. You have the medium zone, which is your transition zone, which has a fairly unstable sky, a lot of water droplets, and you get all sorts of interesting structures in there. And then in the low, you get frequent convection and mixing. It's very moist, and you get a lot of these very kind of like pillowy looking clouds, the cumulonimbuses, and, and structures like that. So most of the pictures that I'm gonna show you are gonna be from the medium zone, the transitional zone. So let's start off with a few smiles here. So one of the nice things to do, and it's what we do when we're out as a family, is to look for shapes in the clouds. And I've just got a couple here, a bear, a fish, a bird, 
And the morning glory clouds are actually real clouds as well. You have to be a bit careful when you see these ones online because often they've been doctored by people to try and make them look a little bit more like the animals they're aiming for. But nonetheless, it's a, a nice example of this pareidolia, this recognizing shapes in random structures. Then we also see a lot of really nice rippling in crowds. And I put some various types of ripples in here. So we've got ripples the, on the right, top right here, which are really kind of like classic ripples. And then moving around, you see these, these ones, which are starved ripples, where you've obviously got, you've got less sediment, so less water vapor and water droplets. So the clouds themselves are, are much more sparse in the sky. So these are exactly like you'd see on a beach in, the, in a modern day setting or along the banks of a river and they're formed pretty much in exactly the same way. So you've, you've got currents moving along through the sky, wind currents, and they are transporting these water droplets and then depositing, to them, depositing them in these rippled shapes. We also see classic dunes and cross beds. And this is where you start really believing in the sedimentology of clouds. I put my perfect dune up here, which is uh, on the top right, which I saw while I, we were flying across the Atlantic. And you can see beautifully the ebb and the soft slopes of this, this dune here as the, the sediment, which is the, the water vapor, is being transported laterally. I actually put this in for a couple of uh, geology photo competitions and it's had no luck whatsoever. You also see cross beds within these structures. And so I've got some bars here on the left hand side and some cross beds within the clouds, which are all demonstrating that you've got this lateral movement. So we've seen ripples, we've seen dunes. And then we also see what are called wave structures. And first of all, you've got this Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. And that's where you've got two different wind layers and some shear between them. And that leads to um, turbulence and, and rotational velocities, which trigger these, the formation of these really striking clouds. You also get this uh, undulous aspiratus type clouds here, which is the, the, this one here. And that cloud is, uh, formed by Mamata, so sort of foundering of, of uh, cloud material, which is then reworked by strong winds. And this, the interesting thing about this type of cloud is it's only recently been recognized as an official cloud classification. And clouds have their, their own classification system, very much like plants and animals. So it's a Linnaean system where you have the, uh, the undulus would be the first name and then the species name would be your aspiratus. So these clouds here, these wave clouds, they are, they're fairly common. And uh, they certainly give you an idea of what's going on in terms of current velocities with air currents. Then there's some other structures in here as well. So basically almost any sedimentary structure that you see on the Earth's surface can occur in the sky as well. So we have primary current lineations on the top left there, some channels running through the clouds, these beautiful foundering clouds here, which are the one a few photo competitions. I've, I've never seen ones quite that good, but you certainly see them around the city here in Calgary and other places as well. Hamaki Gross Strat, so which is you would expect in storm settings. Uh, what I've called a sinkhole hill fill here, this, these ones here, which are lenticular clouds, and then uh, some eddy clouds up at the top right there as well. So just to give you an idea how you could use this material, I've just put a little case study in here of, a, of a, what you might have with a turbidite. So the, the, the diagram I've put in there that I've drawn is of a typical kind of turbidite working its way down slope. And then the cloud pictures I put in here are just some of the typical structures that you might expect to see in that kind of setting. So you can go into the clouds to investigate how turbidites behave in the submarine realm. So let's move on to some industry gems now. And this is just to give you some ideas of what's going on in the industry and something that you guys can apply readily to your research. Okay, I'm missing a couple of images there, but we won't worry about that. So the borehole imaging, who really needs core? We've got, uh, you've got the images which are created by pads which are located on the outside of uh, a device. This device, just showing this device here where you run this device down the hole, the borehole imager down the hole, and it's got pads on the side of it which measure the resistivity. And then you use that resistivity to build up a, a, a two-dimensional image of what's going on. So, oh yeah, so here we go. So this is uh, one example, which is quite funny because it's sort of showing a person in one of these images. And then this is a second one here showing a, a possibly a spider. But so what the important thing to notice here is each of these tracks here is measured by resistivity. And uh, though you use them to build up a, a model of the core and you can actually ro roll that around to make a three dimensional shape as well, which will be showing you the inside of the borehole. So this is just to give you an idea of what these structures, our structures that we typically look like, 
look, look at in the field might look like in, in the subsurface. So remember, these are just measured by resistivity in a hole. We didn't have to take any core here. And you've got IHS at the top left there, trough cost beds. So interesting to compare and contrast these two for those fluvial sedimentologists out there. Planar cross beds, beautifully shown here in the, in the borehole image. We've got mud breccias, bugs, conglomerates, and slumps. And these work equally well in carbonate and clastic settings as well. So there's lots and lots of sedimentological data that we can collect. And I was actually able to use these in a recent project I worked on in South America, where we had uh, data from about 12 boreholes, no core whatsoever, because it's too expensive and too difficult to collect. And yet we had this borehole image data and we were able to build up a nice three-dimensional sedimentological model. So this is just a case study from uh, a rather weird formation, a Precambrian formation in uh, Oman, the Athol Salicylite. And the Salicylite is a laminated chert. And what I've sh shown here is this is in meters. So we've got about a three meter section here through our depositional, uh, our depositional model with some slumping, some uh, laminated uh, cherts, and some concretions in there as well. And we didn't have any core from this well. This is our outcrop analog, which is from the Pilbara in Western Australia, showing what these features would look like in the field. And then you can quite clearly see these structures in, in the borehole image as well. So we've got some nice concretions there, some laminated sediments, and uh, we've also got evidence of slumping in here as well. So we, it's very nice that you can use these structures to build up a very nice depositional model. Tomography and sedimentology. CT tomography scanning of core plugs is something that's really advanced in the last three or four years. And what happens is that you use x-rays to build up images of what's going on in your core plug. So it, these are extremely detailed. Each of these core plugs here is probably around two centimeters, three centimeters in length. And the resolution is around half a millimeter within these core plugs. So we're basically able to deconstruct these core plugs. And I'm just showing you some pictures here. This is showing the class in a, a, a micro conglomerate. This is showing the matrix with pores. This is showing the pore space is filled in in white, and then this is just the pore space. So first of all, it's great for evaluating reservoirs, but what else do you think we could use them for as, as more academic sedimentologists? Well, probably for pore distribution, subtle grain size changes, and also looking at the percentage of pore spaces within our, our different types of sand, sandstone and limestone deposits. So plenty of uh, food for thought there, and that's something that's not too expensive to go ahead and collect. And finally, I just wanted to put this in because it's, there's some lovely images associated with seismic sedimentology. And I mean, I remember when I did my PhD, which is about 20 years ago, that this was the, the new thing was seeing channels in the subsurface. But as well as being able to see the channels, and we've got some lovely examples here from the oil sands. So these are meandering channels with mud plugs. This is a mud plug sitting here. These are the point bars that are sitting in here as well. A lot of work's been done on these. But you can start interpreting the fill of the channels and looking at LAS versus cross bedded sand. So this, this in here, we've got some unit, unit bar deposits. So these are different bars that we've uh, been able to image with the, the seismic. And here we've got a rare example of a braid plane as well. So we can start using these to not only interpret, yes, there are channels, depositional setting, but also paleo flow direction and channel density as well. One of the interesting things that I was just going to point out is that when you look at all of this seismic, we've got heaps and heaps of seismic here in uh, Western Canada. And finding braid planes is almost unbelievably rare in the subsurface. So a lot of those deposits, which you might interpret as braided because of the amount of trough cross beds, they may still be meandering. So I think meandering channels are a lot more prevalent than braided channels. Today we're gonna move on to one of my favorite topics now, sedimentological weirdness, and look at some of the weirdest sedimentological deposits I've ever come across. And we're gonna start off with these cones here, which are from the Grand Canyon. And this is a, this, the, the field of view here is only about two feet, but we've got these beautiful cone-like structures and I still don't know exactly why they formed, or I think I know why they formed, which was just from water kind of dripping down onto the top of them. But what I wonder is why they're so rare and why we don't see them in other settings. So if any of you guys have seen anything like this that you'd like to share, please let me know. Many of you have probably been to Hanksville. There's some really classic fluvial deposits there in the Somerville Formation, which is Middle Jurassic in age. Dominantly meandering channels, include some dinosaur and even pterosaur trackways, so it's a really cool deposit. But I found this bed when we were out in the field with these really weird circular patterns. And we had a good look at them to see whether maybe it might've been somebody scraping them off with a scraper or something like that. No evidence of that. 
So we have these circular patterns. Are they concretions? Are they some kind of carving? Are they a very weird trace fossil, like a vertical zoophycus style trace? Or maybe you know better. So once again, anybody who has any ideas, please feel free to share with me. The next example I have here is from uh, Saudi Arabia. We went out into the field and uh, looked at a lot of uh, desert deposits. There were a lot of um, glacial deposits as well. They're very interesting in the, the Permian and early Triassic in this area because you've got such a mix of depositional settings. But we found this one outcrop, which I just called gloop. And gloop is just these huge depositional lobes here. And there's one of those lobes picked out. There's another one of these lobes picked out. So we've got about 10 meters of lobes which are pretty much featureless inside. So they're suggesting that the sand has been homogenized with large scale soft sediment de deformation. Now, why might this have happened? It may relate to rapid transgression and loading from overlying mudstone beds, but ov overall, we're still not completely sure. So I, I gave this a little talk on this at BSRG probably about 10 years ago. And the coolest thing was that people started writing to me afterwards about gloop. And I just used this silly term, which kind of reminded me of Augustus Gloop from Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, and people were writing to me a, a, in very professionally about uh, this technical term gloop. So uh, hopefully the term gloop will stick, and I really need to publish this up so that we can get gloop out there into the uh, academic realm. Carbrication, I just put this in for a little bit of fun, really, where we understand pebble imbrication very well. I've got an example here on the top left from Budley Salterton, where you can see all of the pebbles here all dipping down towards the left-hand side which suggests that, that the flow direction is actually towards the right. So the, the, what's happening is that the, the flow is moving over these pebbles rather than being able to flip them. And we see the same thing happening in floods. And one of the ways that you can see this most, most well is in where cars are carbricated. So the, the cars themselves are imbricated. So the, the, the flow of the flood would be in this direction in this photograph, that way. And it's built up this line of cars here. And you can see that's, that example is from South Dakota. We have an example from Southeast France. And then we have these striking examples of these floods, which are related to the tsunami that happened in that Japanese earthquake of 2011. So this is when the, uh, the Fukui uh, reactor was uh, ruptured. But uh, also we saw some amazing pictures of these cars. And you can actually use the car orientations to work out where the flood's gone through your city. So you can actually start mapping out the carbrication to give you an idea of the flood patterns. Another interesting sedimentological example, which was only really solved in 2013. So if you go to Death Valley, you get these absolutely flat pliers, dry lake beds, and they have these pebbles on them, which you can clearly see from this picture over here have been moved and shifted through time. But how does this happen on a completely flat surface? How does this class here make its way two, three hundred meters across a flat lake bed. And it was only solved when some guys literally went out there and sat in Death Valley and set up cameras and watched for weeks to see what happened to these. And they found that there were very, very thin ice layers forming underneath the, each of these class. And those, the, the ice layer may have only been a couple of millimeters thick, but uh, that allowed this, the, the, the uh, class to surf their way across the playa moved by winds and some of the winds were up to 15 were quite strong and they would move the rocks at up to 15 feet a minute and these dramatic bits of video stills here are showing what happened to these class uh, that were getting moved sent literally centimeters through time um i went to southeast spain years ago on a field trip and uh, we started mapping out an outcrop which had some, it looked like it had a few little faults in it. And I was trying to work out what was going on with the sedimentology. And we, where we stopped, we parked basically down here. And there is a car there, I think, for scale to show you the immense size of this, this block here. And then, so we started off mapping it and then we stepped back and it was a lesson in thinking at different scales. And we stepped back and saw that the whole outcrop was basically one class. So these class, these are listoliths. There's another one sitting in here. These are individual class of sediment that can be house size or even the size of a city block that have moved down slope. And often as a result, they uh, be become contorted because the sediment is relatively fine grained and you end up with basically a giant, giant pebble. And, uh, and it's only when you step back and get a, an idea of the scale 
that you get to see that these are just one individual sedimentary feature. So a conglomerate made up of these would probably occupy the size of a small town. But it is a very useful learning about not having any preconceptions about scale. Okay, so along with uh, crazy sedimentology, there are also a lot of crazy traces out there. This trace here was confidently interpreted by a colleague of mine as a sturgeon feeding trace. So this is, a, if you look at the edge here, the reason that you have this sort of scoured conglomeratic fill, his idea was that there was a, some kind of fish there that was blowing into the seabed and then collecting uh, all of the organisms that were washed out as a result. And there's a really nice paper by Murray Jinga on walrus feeding traces, which looks at the same thing. So I've just got a few examples here, but my favorite example of a potential trace fossil are these stunning, stunning structures which are found off Japan. And divers finally identified the makers of these as a 10 centimeter long puffer fish. So the puffer fish spends a week to create the nest, decorates it with shells, which it carries in its mouth one by one, and it uses it for wooing. And then hopefully if they do find a mate, the mate will come and live there with them and they can use it as a nest. And just to give you an idea of the scale, there is the 10 centimeter little puffer fish in the middle who's gone to all this trouble. And I think there's probably many examples of this in the fossil record. But right now, fish fossils are usually uh, restricted. The, the igno fossils are restricted to Beaconites and a few fish sort of burrows that they hide in when uh, things get dry. But these bream holes here, which you can see, which look like these little craters, and the tilapia as well, these are all potential nests that we might find in the fossil record. So when you see a depression like this and you're thinking, well, that looks like it might be a dinosaur footprint, they could be fish as well. For our next enigmatic trace, we're going to move to Eastern Borneo. And I always feel that no talk is really complete without some fossil mangroves. When I was studying in, in uh, Eastern Borneo, I found some amazing bird tracks. It was probably the highlight of my whole PhD was finding this bed of bird tracks in the field. And they're shown on this top left-hand diagram here. You can see the footprints. They're very typical of a, a plover-like bird. There's no hallux, which is the little claw that sticks out at the back. And they have that very odd triangular shape to them as well. And in addition to these, you can see that there's a, some little round marks as well, which I, I'll call blobs. That's the technical term. And uh, when you start looking around and looking through the different beds that are associated with these footprints, I found this trace fossil as well. So this trace fossil you can see is a sort of zigzag trace fossil, almost like a feather falling to the ground. And I never really knew what that was. And I asked a few trace fossil specialists and no one had ever seen anything like it. So a few years later, I went to Africa on holiday and there was a beautiful lagoon there with lots of fossil, lots of hippos in it. And I, I wanted to go and see what the hippo footprints look like. So I walked out onto the beach, not too close to them because hippos are pretty scary animals when they get roused. And I saw this little bird here, and this little bird is a plover, and the plover was wafting its beak back and forth across the beach. And it was creating these kind of feeding traces here. So you can see the feeding traces have got this same kind of zigzag signature to them. Now, they're not quite as neat as these ones. So obviously our Miocene plovers were much, they were neater eaters. But nonetheless, this gives us a really good chance to see that most likely this is a modern analog to what I was seeing in the fossil record. So I would describe my, my fossil wiggles and also these little blobs here, which would be where the bird was poking its beak into the sediment as bird feeding traces. And the, the, the technical term which I've invented is ornithoconignology. And the reason I've invented it is that I could not find any other papers on fossil bird feeding traces. Now we're going to talk about lex and urolites. So first of all, Lockley, Martin Lockley, who's an excellent uh, ecologist, found large paired scoop-shaped depressions at several locations in Colorado. And this is an example here. And they don't think they're nests because there were no eggshell fragments, no babies, no little bits of, of uh, bone there. And the sides of the scoops are marked by these deep scratches. And what they think is that they are leks. So very similar to what uh, sage grouse make where the, the, the sage grouse form a kind of circle and then they strut their stuff. They kind of do this with their claws to try and impress the females, which uh, I, if I was a female sage grouse, I probably wouldn't be very impressed by that. But uh, it seems like the dinosaurs were doing the same thing. There's some kind of courtship rit ritual where they're pouring the ground to try and impress the females. And this is a reconstruction of what might be going on. So sort of dinosaur love vest 
is what's going on there. And then on the other side of the coin, everyone has to use the bathroom and that includes dinosaurs. So it, there's lots of dinosaur coprolites around, dinosaur poops. And this is an example of this very exciting specimen that was found in Saskatchewan, which is the first confidently identified T-Rex poop. So it's pretty long, this, this guy. He's about two and a half feet long. And uh, unlike most poops that we see, he's, it's obviously quite, quite a loose stool that he has here. But uh, you can see ones that are really nicely rounded and uh, sometimes they're mineralized as well. But not only those, dinosaurs have to wee as well. And usually, most of us wee a lot more than we, we have go for number two. So uh, wee traces are pretty rare and not very well recognized. But this is an example of what's called a urolite, so a, a dinosaur pea trace that was discovered in Brazil. There's also ones that have been found in Utah as well. So that's something else that you should look out for in the field, particularly if you're working on Cretaceous and Jurassic sediments, as you may find something pretty exciting like this. Okay, I'm going to look at giants of sedimentology now. Uh, I gave a talk at, about the world's biggest sedimentary structures at BSRG last uh, Christmas. And I'm working on the coffee table book, The Guinness World of Sedimentology. But in the meantime, I thought I'd just identify the biggest three sedimentary features on Earth. And in third place, we have Lake Agassiz, which is found in Canada and the US. And it's Pleistocene in age, only around probably 30 or 40,000 years old. And what happened was that you had this giant proglacial lake formed by meltwater. And it was constrained mostly by the, the, the glaciers that were around it, which allowed this giant lake to build up. And the size is around 440,000 square kilometers. So the area is larger than the Great Lakes combined. And it's interesting that, uh, that the, one of the reasons why the drainage is there and the, and the lake was formed was to do with a 2.8 meter rise in sea level. So it doesn't take much sea level to start creating these giant features. Our runner up in second place, Silver medal, in terms of its size, is the Barmafucha River Basin. So the biggest brave plain in the world, encompassing the Ganges Delta as well. And the size of this feature is 650,000 square kilometers. It's formed by the ninth biggest river in the world. And like many braided systems, it's associated with rapidly eroding mountains. Yeah, another example would be in Iceland. And just to show you that despite the fact that it's described as a braid plane, there's actually lots of meanders associated with this feature as well. So that brings us to the mother of all sedimentary features, which is the boreal ocean delta in the Barents Sea and it's Triassic in age. And this was located on the northern Pangaea passive margin. And the size of this feature is 1,650,000 square kilometers. So at the time, this delta covered 1% of all land on Earth. So absolutely huge feature that emptied into a pretty shallow basin and uh, it grew over a million years in a monsoonal climate. So just to compare this, this is the TBO, the, the Boreal Ocean Delta. And you compare that to the Ganges Brahmaputra that we were just talking about, the Amazon, you can see that this thing is on a totally different scale. So this is basically draining about half of Pangaea into the sea to the north of Pangaea. Okay, we're going to finish off by extrapolating to other worlds. So to celebrate Earth Day, I thought we'd go off planet. And really, I, I had some great ideas about what I was going to show you guys with super heavy gravity and all sorts of features like that. There are a lot of different exoplanets out there, Earth size, Earth like, super Jupiters, gas giants, lots of ideas about exoplanets. But almost all of them seem to fall into two types. They're either big and gassy or small and rocky. And if they're small and rocky and they start getting a bit bigger as, they, as they, the material pulls together by gravity, then you tend to have a trend where you go from small and rocky to big and gassy. So most of the exoplanets are one kind or the other. So you could say they're Earth-like, sort of Earth-like, or they're Jupiter-like. So th those are the main categories. So all of these other Earths that you see in science fiction and things like that, are, are, the worlds, they're, they're pretty unlikely in comparison to those two types, which is a little bit disappointing. So gas giants most commonly composed primarily of gas or ice. They have a thick atmosphere. The cores are made of liquid hydrogen and liquid ammonia. And the, the cores of the planets are intense pressures and temperatures. So this little core sitting in here is at high temperatures with, with wafting atmosphere around it. So what's the likelihood we're going to find sedimentary structures here? Well, sadly, 
pretty low, really. The atmosphere is going to have cloud-like ripples, waves and dunes. So that cloud sedimentology would be a good, very applicable here, but with zero preservation potential. And the jet streams are circling the planet at around 380 miles per hour. So they are definitely going to create some structures in the sky. And I read this nice thing that it's possible that it might even rain diamonds on places like Jupiter on these gas giants. But internally, so in this core area, is going to be utterly flat, rather like ferns. So when you squash all of the ice together in ice, ice cores, so pretty, pretty disappointing. You're going to, you might get some chalk like stump slumps in there from the, like, like you see in the upper chalk. But generally speaking, you're just going to have very flat surfaces. So gas giants are not going to be very good for sedimentology. You do have ocean worlds and super earths as a, a potential. We haven't actually found those for sure, but there's a, a good chance that we might see those. So some of the big gas dwarfs could be ocean planets. And there's even an estimate and a couple of papers published that suggest that a third of exoplanets could be water worlds with oceans. Now, this is not generally very friendly oceans. The surface temperature could be up to 500 degrees C, water dominated atmosphere. And then as you go down into the, the deep ocean, which might be 200 kilometers deep of, of water, which is just incredible to even think about, you'd have solid ice at depth due to the immense pressures that were operating there. So the water worlds may have currents due to temperature differences higher up in the water column, but the, the ice surface at the base of those seas, rather like methane deposits in, the, in our deep oceans, is likely to be pretty much amorphous and undulating, but otherwise fairly featureless. And it's unlikely you're gonna have a lot of uh, circulation at that depth. So once again, I don't think there's a very high likelihood of sedimentary structures there either, which is disappointing. And then Goldilocks planets, so planets kind of like Earth. So rock, small rocky planets, they are gonna have a good chance of having sedimentary structures. And it's interesting that Mars is actually within the outer Goldilocks zone of our solar system. So we may be thinking, Oh yeah, the Goldilocks zone, we could go and live there, but Mars actually falls within that zone. And obviously Mars is very unlikely to be inhabited. Now, there's lots of papers and lots of experts working on Mars, so I'm not gonna to pretend to have any details which they wouldn't have. So there are better people than me who know more about this. But nonetheless, likelihood of sedimentary structures in these kind of planets is yes, there's gonna be giant dust storms, but thin atmosphere means that you're, you're unlikely to have a lot of kind of like oomph to those storms. So they won't have a lot of power because the atmosphere is so thin. They'll be extremely cold, so there's no flowing water. But you may see uh, carbon dioxide snow falling in places. But we do see dunes which can reach hundreds of feet in height. And these dunes are still active. So we're still seeing movement and migration of these dunes around two feet per Earth year. Although the processes that drive those might be a little bit different to what's happening on Earth. And I've got some images here, a couple of images from Mars to show you a nice five meter high dune here. There's a wheel of the, one of the rovers sitting in the corner here for scale, and then some other dune fields sitting over here. So you are gonna get dunes, but uh, as, as for other sedimentary structures, we'll see. So gas giants have compressed ice. Rocky planets have some cool geomorphology. And, and if you look at the geomorphology of these, these rocky planets, you can see the tallest mountain, 22 kilometers on Vesta, tallest volcano, 25 kilometers, a cliff 20 kilometers high on Uranus, craters and canyons. So these are all geomorphological features, but in terms of sedimentary features and sediments that have built up, it seems like really we don't go much beyond dunes. So these are the planets with dunes in our solar system, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Pluto and Titan. And Pluto does pretty well, it's got 100 feet tall dunes, but some of these dunes, they're a little bit different to what we might see on Earth. So they're steeper due to low gravity. The ripples may be more closely spaced and the sediments may also be stabilized by static electricity. So I was hoping to investigate the impacts of gravity with huge dunes, thousands of feet high and dunes that are so flat, you can barely see them. I thought enormous wind speeds, we're gonna have some amazing dunes. Planet-wide storms, HCS could be incredible. And I also thought maybe a few other worldly life and traces. And really, it doesn't seem like that's a very likely proposition right now. So instead, I'm going to write a new science fiction novel, which is going to be called cross Bedded Dune to explore those ideas. So let's review what we've learned today. And just before we do, I wanted to show you a picture of Geoparadolia. And this is the, the art of seeing animals and faces in rocks. And I think most of us geologists are pretty familiar with that. So this is an elephant from... Nevada. Anyway, in summary,
there are obviously a myriad sedimentary traces and structures out there. And I've put some nice examples here to show you the variety of what you might see, everything from core to outcrop, to giant scale to small scale. So do keep an open mind when you go looking for analogs everywhere. They can be on the side of your car. They can be in a pond. They can be in an outcrop or they could be pretty much anywhere you go, you may find something sedimentological. And once you find anything interesting from a sedimentological viewpoint, think about what you can learn from them in terms of scale, internal architecture, composition, diagenesis, and any traces that you might come across. And then think about the best tools to evaluate them. So I have a lot of more extra information on these topics to share if anybody is interested. And I'm just gonna finish off with one last diagenetic structure which is this giant sinkhole from China. And I have this funny feeling that that's where most of my talks are going to end up. So thank you and stay healthy. Thank you very much, John. Um, I'm sure like, if, if we were in a normal room, there'd be a round of applause for you right now, but it's, it's difficult to over, um, over Skype. Yes, we've got, we've got some comments coming through for you saying, excellent, thank you very much, well done. Um, really enjoyed that. So whilst people are typing up their questions, which I'm sure there will be um, several of, um, I'm just going to talk to, uh, well, um, let you know that the, um, anyone who's watching this on the recording, if you have a question, the, we still can ask those questions on forums on SEDS online. So please feel free to go ahead and add now, but it's, it's difficult. To offer, um, over Skype, yes, we've got, we've got some comments coming through for you saying, excellent, thank you very much, well done. Um, really enjoyed that. So whilst people are typing up their questions, which I'm sure there will be um, several of, um, I'm just going to talk to, uh, well, um, let you know that the, um, anyone who's watching this on the recording, if you have a question, we still can ask those questions on forums on SEDS online. So please feel free to go ahead and, and, and ask away. Um, and that forum will stay there. So it doesn't matter when you're um, watching this in like 2000 and future, um, then please feel free to, to post your questions on the forums. So um, we have a couple of questions that have come through for you, John. Yeah, I saw the first one. So. Yes, I, that, that's a very interesting idea about the Grand Canyon. Just be, because, because, sorry, just because yeah. the um, people aren't going to be able to see these on the recording, I'll, I'll surely read I it. say that as well. So, so someone suggested that maybe the Grand Canyon was a wind, wind blown set of, or wind scoured and, and th those cones that we saw in the photograph. And I think that's a, that's a cool idea. I, have, I, I got 12 photographs from there. It was a very quick rafting stop when we were going down the canyon. And so I, I didn't really have a lot of chance to look at it in detail, but that's a really interesting idea. And, I, and I, I'm gonna see whether I can have a look at some of the hoodoos around here and around our Calgary area and going out towards the, the Rockies to see whether maybe there are something at a smaller scale because that, 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 that's kind of triggered some ideas for me. So that's a really good question. And then I see a question here about the radial structures around the Mars South Pole or sediment structures. There's some people who've done a lot of work on this and PhDs. So, um, from, from Imperial College. And I think they're probably the real people to ask about this, but yeah, I don't want to dismiss Mars as only having its dunes. We know that it's got some amazing canyon features as well. But yeah, those radial structures, I really don't know that much about them, but I could well imagine that they were sedimentary features as well. And I, I would like it if everybody could keep an eye out for weird sedimentary structures, because we were talking about how nice it would be to have a, a forum or maybe at the next BSRG to have a session where we just bring up the things that we don't understand. You know, everyone's very busy giving talks on things that they've interpreted and that they do understand, but maybe it would be nice to have a session, which will be the kind of like the mysteries of sedimentology where people just bring up ideas and don't really know what's going on and we can start discussing it as a, as a group. So I, I, I'm quite happy to share that. <laughs> Well, in the, in the Zone 1 coffee meeting on Monday, we actually had this idea of an identification day. So if more people are interested in that, um, please do like, let us know and we, we could facilitate something through SEDS online. Yeah, well, that'd be great. Oh, look, someone's seen cones in Italy, New Zealand, UK and building sites. <laughs> <laughs>
So I'd be very interested to see uh, some more stuff on the cones because that's the, that's been one of my little bugbears. I mean, I saw them about ten years ago, and I've never really got to grips with why they were there. That's great. Lots of future potential to work things out. Always love that. Um, so it seems like um, some of the questions we could we can move some of these questions over. If you think of a question later, of course, as well. Um, into the forums and we can start having a, a great discussion about the unknowns and the knowns. Um, so just a couple of notices then before we, um, we close up for today. Um, we've got um, next week's talk organised and it's going to be a good one. I'm really looking forward to it. So Dr Matthias Green is going to be um, presenting on a journey through tides in Earth's history. Um, he's from Bangui University and the abstract is on the website so you can go check that out. We're also um, asking for your opinions on what you would like to see in these webinars in the future. So we're going to be launching some instructional webinars in a couple of weeks, and we're currently taking votes and suggestions on what you would like to see um, uh, on, on and links to all of that is on the events page um, on SEDS online. So please go ahead and fill them in. Also, we, um, we've got a form for if you want to suggest a speaker as well for a, a webinar. Um, our copy breaks went global last week and they were really successful. Stephen actually um, went to all of them within 24 hours. So I think he needs a medal or something for that. <laughs> and, um, and they were really great. And um, the community worldwide is great. So if, if you really are thinking about going to one of these coffee meetings, please go along to them because they're really worthwhile. They brighten the day. We're also collecting resources on the teaching library, um, which is building up and it's been uh, really interesting now with some a wide range of resources from virtual field courses, lectures, practicals. Um, and um, some people have been talking about having to do hybrid teaching in the next semester. So anything that you can share, I think is going to help the community an awful lot uh, when we get to that time. So, yeah, um, that's those are our main notices. I just want to say thank you again to John and happy birthday and thank you so much for giving up um, an hour on your birthday for, um, for this endeavour. Um, thank you very much. Well, thanks to everybody who listened as well. Uh, it's a pleasure actually. And have a great day everyone. You too.